Greetings everybody. Welcome to Chemistry 103 once again. Today we're starting a unit that has previously been grouped together into merely the topic ionic and molecular compounds. However, the book splits this up into two chapters. It starts with ionic compounds because they're slightly simpler and then it moves on to molecular compounds which involve a slightly more elevated discussion. So today we're going to cover just the material concerning ionic compounds and then next week we will cover molecular compounds in their entirety and then we will move on later to chemical reactions and some of the other processes that happen involving various molecules and elements. I hope all of you have gotten a chance to start the test that I posted. And if you need any assistance at all, please remember that Mason Minolera is available for tutoring on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 12.30 to 2.30 on the Zoom room. Uh, and he, I guess nobody has gone yet, so please make use of that if you need to. All right, so beginning, we're going to need to discuss something called the octet rule when we talk about ions because the way that ions form is directly related to the number of electrons that are present in the atom in question. So compounds are any pure substance that results from the combination of two or more elements held together by chemical bonds. So up to this point, we've really only talked about elements and atoms. We've maybe had a little bit of introduction to the idea of molecules, but now we're going to outline exactly what makes a molecule a molecule. And the first thing is the idea of a chemical bond, which consists of the attractive forces that hold atoms or ions together. And they are bonds that can be broken down by normal means into simpler substances called elements. <coughs> so there are two types of bonding. There are there's ionic bonding which involves the transfer of one or more electrons from one atom or group to another, such as in sodium chloride or NaCl, which is standard table salt. And then there is another type of bonding called covalent bonding, bonding when two or more atoms share an electron or two between them, such as in hydrogen fluoride or HF. And... In this case, the covalent bonds form between the outermost electrons. So in the orbital structure, you have the sublevels and the different shells, the S, P, D, and F. The electrons that are farthest from the nucleus will be the ones that participate in the chemical bond. So back to the octet rule. So when a compound forms, the atoms must lose, gain, or share electrons to produce a noble gas electron configuration. Now, if you remember from our discussion of the periodic table, the noble gases are all the way to the right in the column that includes helium, neon, argon, krypton, and so on. All of these gases have eight electrons in their outer shell, and this is considered to be the stablest arrangement of electrons that can exist for that size of atom. So for instance, when the sodium atom loses its 1s valence electron, the electron configuration that remains is the electron configuration of neon. So it loses an electron, which means that it gains a positive charge, but the electrons that remain take the same configuration that neon would have. So positive ions are formed whenever an electron or more electrons are lost from a metal, and they tend to be named just as the name of the element followed by ion, 
and the atom becomes charged. So the charge on the ion is equal to the number of electrons lost because we remember that there's charge balance in an atom and the nucleus has positive charge and the electrons have negative charge. So when you lose negative charge, the total charge must increase. So here are some examples. We have sodium. We have an atom of sodium. If it loses an electron, it becomes sodium plus and one electron, which is the symbol E minus. And we call this a sodium ion. Likewise, magnesium loses two electrons to form a magnesium two plus ion. The name of the metal is magnesium. The name of the ion is magnesium ions. And then similarly for aluminum, you start with aluminum. You lose three electrons because it's in group 3A and you form an aluminum ion. It's pretty straightforward, but it's good to know. Calcium likewise loses two electrons and forms calcium ions. So ionic bonding generally involves transferring of electrons between two or more atoms. So in this process, a positively charged atom is produced because an electron moves from an, a neutral atom to another atom, leaving behind positive charge and causing the other atom to gain a negative charge. The positively charged atom is called a cation. In general, metals in groups 1A, 2A, and 3A easily lose electrons to acquire noble gas configurations. So the entire leftmost column, group 1A, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, all have one S electron in their outer valence shell, and this is easily removed to leave behind a positively charged ion with a stable noble gas electron configuration. Similarly, for magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium, they don't include beryllium in this list because beryllium isn't standard in its behavior, although it does form doubly charged ions. It's just not as straightforward as for magnesium. Similarly, for boron above aluminum in the periodic table, it technically has space for three valence electrons, but because it's there aren't that many electrons in the atom to begin with. It, the, the dynamics are not necessarily as straightforward. But these, num these me metals are good ones to keep in your mind because they display standard behaviors. Negative ions are the result of an electron being absorbed by an atom to give a net negative charge. These ions are named by using a root of the parent atom and adding ide to the end of it. And the total charge is equal to the number of electrons gained in the process of forming it. So here are some examples. Fluorine plus one electron yields the fluoride ion. You can see the ide suffix. Likewise, bromine, which is another halogen, gains an electron to form bromide. Oxygen gains two electrons to form oxide. And sulfur gains two electrons to form sulfide. You can sort of see where this is going. And here's another fun flow chart. So a negatively charged ion is called an anion. And the nonmetals in groups 5A, 6A, and 7A will generally gain electrons easily to acquire a noble gas configuration. So nitrogen will gain three electrons to form the noble gas configuration of neon. Oxygen will gain two. Fluorine will gain one. Phosphate 
or phosphide, I'm sorry, will gain three electrons to form the argon configuration, and so on and so forth. This is, these are all pretty straightforward behaviors across the board, so it would be good to know them. Now, because ionic bonding involves the transfer of electrons, the compounds that are formed from these ions are held together by electrostatic attraction between positive and negative ions, also known as an ionic bond. Most solid crystalline substances are formed from ionic compounds. Uh, they are generally formed from, by, from an ordered lattice of oppositely charged ions. So if you have a sodium chloride crystal, there will be sodium surrounded by negatively charged chloride, which will in turn be surrounded by positively charged sodium, and so on and so forth, in a repeating fashion in three dimensions. Now, Furthermore, these compounds are generally composed of metals and nonmetals. So, a good example sodium chloride, sodium fluoride, sodium sulfide, those are all a metal sodium and a nonmetal sulfur. Uh, you can do this across the board throughout the peri entire periodic table. If there are bonds between metals and nonmetals, they will generally be ionic, except in some specific cases. And bonds between nonmetals and nonmetals, or metals and metals, are generally covalent in nature because of similarities in the electronic structures. Ionic compounds tend to have high melting temperatures because of the strength of the electrostatic attraction between the ions. So... Here's an example of a sodium chloride crystal. Ionic compounds do not exist as single molecules. Because of the nature of their bonding, the raw positive and negative charge of ions is not stable in isolation. It relies on a repeating structure that sort of stabilizes the charge polarization in order for these compounds to exist. So the ions are packed together in a lattice and you only see them as crystals. If you get small enough, they start to lose their crystal structure until you end up with just a gas phase ion. The important thing to remember about ionic compounds is that they have to have a, a total neutral electric charge if they are to exist in a stable form. There is such a thing as uh, a binary ionic compound. This is when you have only two elements, a metal and a nonmetal, present in, the, in fixed ratios within the material. When writing a, a ionic compound, you always put the symbol of the cation first and then the anion second. And the sum of the positive charges and the negative charges must equal zero. Um, we indicate how many of each atom are or ion are is in the molecule with a subscript in the name and this represents the fixed ratio of one atom to another in the molecule. So some examples of subscripts in formulas. Um, you have sodium chloride, we keep using this example. It's formed from sodium and chlorine atoms, and an ionic bond forms between a positively charged sodium ion and a negatively charged chloride anion. anion. In this process, each sodium loses one electron to achieve the octet form uh, electron configuration, and each chlorine atom gains one electron to achieve its octet configuration. Its formula is NaCl. The subscript in this case would be 1 for both of these elements. 
and you can see the picture here. The electron from sodium moves to chlorine. Sodium is positive, chlorine is negative, and they stick to each other. Now, in contrast, magnesium chloride is formed from magnesium and two chlorine atoms. So there's twice as many chlorine as magnesium. This happens because the ionic bond forms in which magnesium gives up two electrons to get a positive two charge, and each of the chloride atoms accepts one electron to get a charge of minus one each. So this leads to both chlorines being attracted to the doubly positively charged nucleus of the magnesium ion, and the resultant formula is MgCl with a 2 in the subscript position. Now you can start to deduce how compounds should be written and also what a compound consists of based on its name or based on its formula. So Subscripts in a formula represent the number of positive and negative ions. So, in this case, this example shown here, you have, uh, they want you to write the formula for the ionic compound containing sodium and nitride. You'll notice here, sodium has a positive one charge when it forms its ion and nitride has a minus three charge. So that tells you that you need to provide three sodiums to compensate for the minus three charge of the nitride ion. And here you see the process of each sodium giving one of its electrons to nitrogen to form nitride and three positively charged sodium ions. And then the formula is Na3N. So the 3 in the subscript indicates the number of sodiums in the molecule. So in ionic compound, compounds containing two elements, um, these are called binary ionic compounds. They can consist of either single cation metals, which are metals that form only one type of positive ion. And then there are other metals called multiple cation metals, which form more than one positive ion. In general, systematic naming uses, always uses the name of the cation first, followed by the name of the anion. This is just for consistency. And you don't, generally say the subscript in a formula when you're saying the name. So if you have, say, magnesium chloride, you don't say magnesium dichloride for the fact that there are two chlorides, you just say magnesium chloride. So starting with single cation metals, these are main group metals in groups 1A, 2A, and sometimes 3A. So, for example, sodium only forms one ion, which is sodium plus. It never forms other ions. It's always just sodium plus. Um, you determine the charge by the position on the periodic table. Uh, this page number is not correct for our book. I um, There isn't really a corresponding table in the OER textbook. However, your periodic table, your interactive periodic table, has a bouquet of various options, and you can, in general, find a number of um, properties of these, including the types of bonding it does. So if you do the, the, the orbitals, you can 
see the various charge states. Each of these is capable. So this sodium is one, potassium is one, magnesium is two. And then you see here some of these ones in the middle. You have multiple different states that they can be a part of. Some of these ones have even more different ions that they can have. And this is useful for trying to determine the ways in which they are found in materials, especially materials that might, where it might be possible for them to have more than one oxidation state in the same compound. So there are, there are metals that form more than one positive ion, and there are metals that form only one. You name the metal cation first, and you name the non-metal anion second, and the single metal cation name is the metal name only. So if a metal doesn't form more than one ion, you don't need to indicate which one it is because it's always the same one. The non-metal anion in this case is just done in the standard way where you change the ending of the name to ide. So that's just review of what we've been talking about. And then this is a little a formula to show you that. So some examples. Sodium iodide is NaI. Calcium fluoride is CaF2. Lithium oxide is Li2O. Silver chloride is AgCl. Potassium chloride is KCl. Sodium phosphide is Na3P. Rubidium sulfide is Rb2S. And magnesium nitride is Mg3N2. Now, for multiple cation metals, you need to indicate which of the ions that you that are in the compound. So the metals that form multiple cations are typically known as the transition metals. They're in groups 3 to 12B, and sometimes the 4A and PA P, or 4A and 5A P block metals. Um, for example, a common one is iron. Iron forms two ions. Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus in chemical reactions, and this very fact is part of the what makes it so important for biology. Um, you, as, as as is true for single metal cations, you determine the charge from the stock system for naming anions, and then you use the metal name followed by a Roman numeral to indicate the charge. So, for example, um, I'm sorry, this is to continue. The, the metal is always listed first in the formula, and the way that you determine what its charge is is from the total charge on anions in the molecule. Um, I'll show you. There's a this. The textbook does have a table for this. It's ta table 5.4.2 on page 121. I will show you that right here. Um, sorry, that's actually not the right thing. Never mind. Uh, okay, so moving on. The way that you determine the charge... So, we'll take copper oxide, for example. Copper can exist in two charge states. It could be either plus one or plus two. But we could also figure that out because we know that oxygen has a negative 2 charge, and in order for that 
to bond to two coppers, each copper must have a positive one charge. So, because the total charge has to be zero, if oxygen has a minus two charge, then the charge due to copper has to be two as well. And therefore, each one has positive one. The way that you, so you would then name this uh, molecule um, using a Roman numeral, so copper with a parentheses I for Roman numeral one, and then as always, the adding I to the oxygen name makes it copper one oxide. So here are some examples, iron iodide, FeI3, we know that there's one iron and it is of indeterminate charge and we know that there are three iodides and iodide always has a negative one charge, so the total charge has to be zero, therefore the iron atom must have a total of positive three charge. So it is iron three iodide. This version of copper oxide, CuO, has only one copper per oxygen. And we know that oxygen has a minus two charge. The total charge has to be zero. And so this is copper two oxide. And then the third one, we have t uh, tin bromide. So we know that bromine has a minus one charge and there are two of them, meaning that to maintain a charge of total charge of zero in the molecule, the tin ion must have a positive two charge and so we name it tin two bromide. Some more examples, SNI4, this is a different version of tin. This version of tin to compensate for the four minus one charges from the iodide has to have a positive four charge and so that makes it tin four iodide. And then we have HGO, this is mercuric oxide. Oxygen has a two minus when it's ionized and so therefore mercury must also have a two plus. And so we have mercury two oxide. And then MnCl2, manganese chloride, we have a minus one charge for each of the two chloride ions, a total charge of zero, means that manganese is in the positive two state, making it manganese two chloride. You can also write formulas from the name of an ionic compound. Um, again, usually involves a metal and a non-metal. So this is how you can identify the cation and the anion. Generally, the metal is the cation and the non-metal is the anion. You can then balance the charges to write the formula. And if it is a multiple cation metal, you then indicate the Roman numeral for the charge of the cation. And then when writing the formula, take the name of the cation first, followed by the name of the anion. So, for example, the compound name lithium chloride. We look through our periodic table and we find lithium and chlorine. Lithium forms a positive one ion and chlorine forms a negative one ion, which means that you balance the charges by making the number equal to each other. So you have one lithium and one chloride and then you write the formula LiCl. There are no subscripts because both subscripts are one. Another example, iron three oxide. So first you 
identify that the iron has a 3 plus oxidation state and oxygen is 2 minus. Therefore, this might, might be a little bit more difficult to balance. However, you know that the total charge has to equal to zero and you probably understand simple arithmetic. So you can deduce that if you multiply three by two and two by three, you get six and those cancel. So writing the formula in this case is Fe2O3, indicating there are two irons and three oxygens in each molecule of this ionic compound. Now there's a thing called polyatomic ions. So sometimes it's not just an atom that ionizes to form a positively or negatively charged unit, but it is in rather a covalently bonded molecule that has a negative charge and is bonded to a metal or nonmetal. Most of the polyatomic ions are negatively charged and many of those are consisting of the what's known as the oxyana the oxyions which are polyatomic ions of phosphorus sulfur carbon or nitrogen that are covalently bonded to one or more oxygen atoms these are always they're never found independently they always are bonded to an ion of opposite charge the only positively charged polyatomic ion is the ammonium ion, which has a positive one charge. So there is a um, table. In fact, that's the table that I tried to show you before in the book that gives you the names of various polyatomic ions and their charges. Uh, it's pretty helpful. Uh, the important ones we'll go through, but it's helpful to understand at least basically what all of these are. Some ones you've probably recognized are things like nitrate, but then there are other ones like nitrite, there's phosphate, there's sulfate, there are uh, carbonate, and all of them are fairly commonly encountered in the world. And we're going to talk about some of these right now, especially the oxyions, which are encountered a lot more often than some of the others. Generally, these ions have names like eight or ite, and there's a system for how those are named. So... There are a lot of polyatomic ions that exist in pairs. So, for instance, nitrate and nitrite have different numbers of oxygen atoms bonded to the central atom. And the pair with the most oxygens is always called the eight, is the eight ion. So nitrate has more oxygen atoms in it than nitrite. Um, same thing with phosphate and phosphite. Phosphate is PO4, 3 minus. And phosphite is PO3, 3 minus. Same with sulfate and sulfite. And then nitrate and nitrite. In addition, group 7A, the halogens, can form more than two types of polyatomic ions or oxyions. So you have to use additional prefixes to differentiate them. The big example of this is the chlorate family. Generally, you start from chlorate and then you move up or down in number of oxygen atoms to obtain the other ones. But bromine and iodine also form these types of polyatomic ions. So, chlorate, in this case, is ClO3-. And the one that is has one more oxygen is called the perchlorate. And it is Cl. O4 minus. Then you have uh, chlorate, and then you have chlorite, which is one less oxygen, so ClO2 minus. 
And then, finally, you have hypochlorite, which is one less oxygen than chlorite. So it's ClO minus. You can write formulas for these compounds in the same way that you write formulas for other ionic compounds. You start with um, assuming that the polyatomic ion is a single unit and it has a charge that applies to the entire unit. Then, once, once you've figured that out, you figure out what the cation is and figure out the correct ratio so that you can achieve a net charge of zero. And if you have more than one of the same polyatomic ion, so say you have two nitrates ions attached to something, you use parentheses and then put a subscript after the parentheses in order to indicate that there is multiples of that molecular unit. So, for example, magnesium carbonate. So we know that magnesium has a 2 plus charge and carbonate has a 2 minus charge from the table. And carbonate is CO3. So in this case, balancing the charges is easy. They're the same. So you have one of each in the molecule. And the formula is then MgCO3. Now, in contrast, calcium nitrate. Calcium has a 2 plus charge, but nitrate only has a minus 1 charge. So you need to have two of them to balance the charges out. So writing the formula involves a parentheses. You see calcium and then parentheses NO3 and parentheses with a 2 in the subscript. It can be a little confusing to keep track of, but that's how you got to do it. And the way that you name them is the same way that you name binary ionic compounds by placing the positive ion, usually a metal, first, and then the polyatomic ion's name following the metal. There are no prefixes used. And generally, if the cation can exist in multiple uh, charge states, you use a Roman numeral to indicate which one is which. And the name of the ion is given in table 5.4.2 on page 121 of your book. That is an accurate table. So we're going to do a couple examples. So iron 3 sulfate. If we want to write the molecular formula for that, we know that iron 3 plus is the ion because it says iron 3. And then sulfate, it has a charge of 2 minus based on the table. In order to balance this, we have to do our little trick where we multiply each of them by their common factor, coming up with a total charge of 6. And therefore, the iron 3 sulfate is written Fe2SO4-3. And then another example, ammonium phosphate. So from our table... We know that ammonium is NH4 plus and phosphate is PO4 3 minus. To balance these charges, you have to multiply NH4 by 3 to match the 3 minus charge of phosphate. And therefore, the formula is NH4 parentheses 3 PO4. This is to indicate that there are three ammoniums. And then, to just go from the molecular formula backwards, starting with CaSO4, that is calcium sulfate. It has a calcium 2 plus ion and a, S, a sulfate 2 minus polyatomic ion. Li2CO3 is lithium carbonate. It has two plus one charged lithiums and 
one negative two charged carbonate. And then AlNO33 is the is aluminum nitrate uh, because aluminum has a three plus charge and nitrate has a minus one charge. And in summary, you always put the cation first, the anion comes second, the sum of positive charges must always be zero, and the number, the numbers that appear in the subscripts always have to be whole numbers, and these indicate the number of each ion in the molecular formula. All right, well, that is it for ionic compounds. Please uh, tune in again next week for covalent compounds, and please do the exam. I will be posting the labs within the next day, and as well as the quiz for this chapter. Hope everybody has a good weekend, and stay safe.